what was interesting to me is is LAFC have have kind of I think completed this change in style and change in philosophy to one that doesn't want to have the ball. You think about the first couple of years, for several years of LAFC, they were dominant on the ball, and that's how they wanted to play, and it was this very appealing to the eye, kind of tiki-taka style. Um, but that has transitioned to being more of a sit-back, defend, and try to open up space behind for a guy like Denis Bawanga, who's the best player in the league in those situations. It worked for them. Look, it, it, MLS is evolving, right? And it's something that Taylor, Taylor Twelman, my broadcast partner, talks a lot about on, on his podcast and even on the broadcast if it comes up, that, that spending is going to open up. This is a league that's always done it intelligently and for good reason, right? And I know everybody wants it to just open wide up. But it has gotten to 30 seasons by being smart, by being intelligent, and maybe by opening up the salary cap slower than some people would want but it's here and it's there and it's thriving and it's the healthiest an american soccer league has ever been and that's a good thing welcome to the vocal Club podcast i'm your host Andrew Gallo, and today we're going to be talking mls and to do that uh who better than jake Simmons, who is the player that played the main the main play-by-play commentator for MLS Surpass on Apple TV. Jake, thank you so much for um, taking the time to come on the podcast. How's it going, man? Man, Edwin, it's great to see you. It's been a while since last year. Uh, we did a game in Nashville together. Uh, it's going great. It's been an exciting start to the season. And uh, yeah, ha- happy to be here. Excited to talk about it. All right. And let's get right to it. Uh, you just said the El Tráfico uh, this yeah. past weekend with LAFC beating LA Galaxy 2-1. Uh, so just to be, I mean, the LA Galaxy came as, I guess, one of the few times that they did the favorite as they had a little better start than uh, the LAFC. Uh, so just uh, tell me that you the mistake I went from that game. Yeah, I think to, to what you just said, there was a little bit of a role reversal heading in from what has been the case the past several years, which was LAFC kind of being this juggernaut in Los Angeles and being, for lack of a better word, kind of the sexy team in Southern California and, and the team that had more of the focus around the league. And through a month and a half this season, it was the Galaxy that had kind of taken back that spot a little bit, I think, where they had used where they were, were used to being for for 15, for 20 years, uh, but where they've kind of been trying to figure out how to get back to really since the Robbie Keane, Landon Donovan era ended. And yes, with Zlatan, they had so many moments and they had so much focus on them. And to an extent when, when Chicharito joined as well, but they hadn't had that consistency of, of being a contender. I mean, they haven't been in MLS cup since when 2014, when they last won. And that's so strange to think about with the LA galaxy, uh, but they look so good to begin this season and LAFC were a little inconsistent to begin the year. Um, so that was different coming into the game. And and I thought it was a really good game. I thought it was a well-played match. The first half was really entertaining. What was interesting to me is, is LAFC have, have kind of, I think, completed this change in style and change in philosophy to one that doesn't want to have the ball. You think about the first couple of years, for several years of LAFC, they were dominant on the ball and that's how they wanted to play. And it was this very appealing to the eye, kind of tiki-taka style. Um, but that has transitioned to being more of a sit back, defend, and try to open up space behind for a guy like Denis Bawanga, who's the best player in the league in those situations. It worked for them, right? Now, it ended two to one. It probably should have ended three or four to one, to be honest, with the chances LAFC created in that second half, despite not having the ball, despite the Galaxy being dominant on the ball for the majority of that second half. So for me, kind of the tactical shift of that, of LAFC specifically, is one of the most interesting talking points from that game. Not one of the most entertaining El Traficos we've had, not one of the least, but not one of the most, Um, but certainly a good appetizer for what I think will be a fantastic second El Trafico on on July 4th at the Rose Bowl this year. Yeah, that's going to be quite the uh, the deceit there. Hopefully it doesn't get rid of like uh, last year when uh, Hakeem had to be suspended. Uh, (laughs) But yeah, I mean, uh, (laughs) just let me see. Uh, so 
what do you make uh, of LAFC? Because they had this slow start and they see that there was something missing there and then some kids were playing better than others. Do you have a better sense now of what this LAFC team can be so far? Or are, are you, or are yeah. you still trying to get to, to what their eventual will be? Well, first of all, I think the roster is not complete yet, you know, and, and you look at the numbers specifically and it's not their fault. It's, it's just kind of the reality of how major league soccer is set up when you win. And when you have success, uh, you're, you're then kind of little hamstrung, um, handcuffed by, by salary cap because all these bonuses go into effect automatically. And now player salaries are significantly higher than they were the year before. And, and now you've got to make some difficult decisions to fit into the salary cap. Um, you know, just prepping, we are prepping for their season opener against Seattle. And normally you prep for each team's got about between 28 and 32 players on a roster. Uh, and so I've got my charts with, with all the player kind of cards and I'm doing LAFC. I get to like 20 and I'm done. Like that's the roster. And, and, and three or four of those guys are teenagers who haven't played yet. Homegrown players, right. Who are probably not going to, going to play in a, in a significant game. They're more for the future and they're going to play for LAFC two and MLS next pro that was staggering. And, and, Honestly, the 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 team with the fewest member, number of players on a roster that I can ever remember preparing for. That's unscientific. Um, they've since signed Kai Kamara and they've signed Maxime Chano. So they've added a couple of veterans to their roster. I think this summer is going to be an transformative uh, transfer window for them. Of course, the reports of Olivia Giroud coming. I have no reason to doubt those reports. Taylor Twelman has been pretty direct on air saying, yeah, that that's happening now until it happens until it's officially announced until he's, he's here. Stuff can always change, but that certainly seems to be in the works. That'll change them. I think there'll be other signings as well. There could be even, you know, uh, openings of the salary cap or openings of the roster mechanisms throughout the league that could change what they do as well. So for LAFC, I, I see them as kind of an incomplete roster right now. And, I was just um, on the Portland Timbers podcast for, for this week. They're playing LAFC on Saturday, actually two of the next three weekends. It's Timbers and LAFC. And I kind of said, look, if you're a Timbers fan, I, this is a good time to play them. You'd rather play them now, I think, than in September, because I don't think this roster is is complete. They've been so different home and away. Uh, they have three wins and a draw and four home games. It's really good. Ten points and four games at home. They have three losses and three games on the road. That's not good, right? Yes, one of those was played in, in a blizzard um, in, in Salt Lake, but then losses in Minnesota and a loss in Colorado when you had the lead and you know you, you feel like probably you should have seen that out. Um, so there's that inconsistency there that, that they're figuring out. But at the end of the day, I think LAFC is still going to be uh, the team that the West goes through, right? And and I, we, I kind of said it throughout all of last year. And I agree now until somebody knocks them off, they are still the team you've got to go through in the Western conference. That could happen. It could happen in the regular season this year, right? That some team kind of knocks them off the mantle, so to speak, just kind of like puts them. But I think come playoff time, the Western conference playoffs still will go through LA LAFC in the sense that they are still kind of the big dogs in the conference, just no matter what their seed is until somebody proves they can beat them in the playoffs. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and uh, just briefly, I want to talk a little bit of the, the takeaways that we got. Uh, we played mostly some play around eight games so far. Uh, so I think just like everyone expected, Vancouver and the Rebels lead the conference. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. laughs> so uh, I mean, just, just the main takeaways of all the, the early impressions of the team so far, or the league so far, uh, what has your attention? Yeah, you're right. Exactly. Just like all the preseason <laughs> uh, predictions. Yeah, look, those are those are certainly two of the teams that that stand out, right? I think what Sander Schwartz has done in New York has been uh, incredibly impressive. We haven't done. I personally haven't called it a Red Bulls game. I've watched a lot of them, um, but even speaking to my colleagues that have have called the games, uh, meaning they've done these. So before every game, we do a broadcast call with the manager where it's a more intimate zoom. It's just the commentators on the game and we're able to get into, it's kind of half on the record, half off the record, sort of, sort of call. Uh, everybody comes away blown away by Sandra Schwartz. Like, like that, you know, text threads blowing up, like, oh man, just talked to him for the first time. He's so impressive. Uh, and the results have shown Emil Forsberg has been uh, a super important signing for them. I think they went too young the past couple of years, right? They didn't have that 
that leader, that player with international experience that they needed. I think last year they were the youngest team in the league or the second youngest to New York City FC. The two New York teams I know were the two youngest in the league, at least in the first half of last year. And Forsberg has, has brought so much to them in that leadership and, of course, the quality. Um, I think he's unlocked a lot of Dante Van Zier and and Lewis Morgan is basically like a new signing for them because he was hurt for all of last year. He played, what, a game or two, and that was it. A guy who we know from how successful and how good he was for Inter-Miami in the pre messy days, in the early days, even in the pre-salary cap sanction days. Um, he's he's found that form again. So they're a transformed team. Um, I think they're legit. They've had, mostly because they can do it in the attack now when last year it was the attack was kind of anemic, but they were so good defensively. And Vancouver, man, like Vanny Sartini, he just gets it done. Remarkable. I mean, he is the biggest character, maybe an MLS player or coach. Uh, he is fun to watch. He is fun to listen to. Um, all those things are great for the league, I think. And they've got a talented team and they're really good uh, home and away. And, and they're off to a great start this year. Will they be atop the West at the end of the year? I don't know. We'll see, but they're certainly have shown that they're a contender. I think as, as they were last year for most of the year, they were in the mix and yeah, it came up against an LAFC team in the first round of the playoffs that, that were good. Can they take that next step? I think is, is the question for Vancouver. Can they win a playoff series? Can they go deep into the Western conference playoffs? We'll see so far. So good for them. So those two teams stand out. The other LA team, LA Galaxy, where we talked about LAFC, but the Galaxy, and I mentioned it a little bit at the beginning, they've stood out to me because I do think they're back. Uh, I think Joseph Paintsell and Gabriel Peck were the additions they needed, changed the team. Um, now you've got the the killer peas of Peck and Paintsell and Ricky Pooch, who I love. I love Ricky. I love watching him play. You know, he's just so smooth and he's so good on the ball and the way he progresses the ball, he kind of glides through the midfield. Uh, I love it. Um, and Dan Jovalic now without Chicharito kind of either in front of him or just kind of still on the roster, but, but rehabbing and, you know, kind of hanging over him, um, has been really good to begin the season. So, uh, that, that to me has been the story overall is like the galaxy, I think are back. I think that's the number one story in the league so far. Uh, not, not, you know. Uh, excluding Inter Miami, which will always get all of the headlines and, and deservedly yeah, so, and will continue through, through throughout the year. Yeah, uh, so I, I made a couple of lists of uh, just uh, early impressions, like surprise teams, teams that are, yeah. have played uh, below expectations, uh, underrated signings. Have, so I just want to bounce uh, a few because I made two or three uh, teams per 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 category. Uh, so surprise PT so far, I put. The three that we just uh, talked about, Vancouver, Red Bulls, and LA Galaxy. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have anyone else uh, that, that maybe has surprised you a little bit? Minnesota, right? I mean, what they did to begin the year without a coach was was spectacular. You know, we had to all um, submit our preseason predictions on MLSsoccer.com. And I hate, I hate predicting things, especially in my <laughs> role. I, I just don't, you know, I, I don't think there's much benefit for me and there's only risk because you got to pick somebody last, right? Like that's the thing. You can't, you got to yeah. pick somebody last. Someone's got to go in that spot. Um, and, and I picked Minnesota because at the time they didn't have a coach. Emmanuel Reynoso was still in Argentina and that could still be an issue again now because he's back there, right. And missing a green card appointment and, and you don't know what's going to happen with that. But it, it, to be honest, it, it, I don't know that they need him anymore, which is remarkable. Um, but the way that, that they played under Cameron Knowles to begin the season and, and now kind of, you know, continue that on and in some quality with, with Eric Ramsey and just the spirit that they have as a group. So impressive, man. This could easily be a team without a coach, uh, you know, with tumult around their star player that just kind of like packed it in to begin the season, especially. And they didn't. And that's massive credit to everybody on that team and in that organization. And that would be the other one that has been the big surprise uh, for me to begin the season. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, I was actually in, in St. Paul this weekend uh, for the Arizona mm -hmm. game. Uh, so Arizona played much better the first half, the second half. They had a couple of chances that they couldn't put away. And they all signed the last 20, 25 minutes, uh, Minnesota to control. They tied the game. They were they had a chance to win it. And I think they've scored like seven goals after the 85th minutes. Yeah. Something like that so far is kind of crazy, but yeah. It says a lot, right? That says a lot about a team when they do that. It says that they believe. It says they they're in it together. All that to me, that that's a legitimate thing. I think there's something to that, and it says a lot about them. Uh, now on the on the flip side of the coin, uh, so teams that I think under have underperform uh, so far from the expectations that we have for them. Uh, I have three, three clear ones: Orlando City, the New England Revolution, and the Seattle Sounders. 
Yeah. Those would be the three for me. I agree. Just because I think all of those teams coming in um, would expect to be atop the conference, right? In their respective conference and, and challenging for the conference titles. Um, the East is so good and you've got to be at your best every week. Because it, 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 I said this before the season started. I mean, I think you could have made an argument for nine teams to win the East. And that wouldn't be the case in the West um, at all. But but nine teams like, yep, I could see them winning. Yep, I could see them winning. Certainly Orlando and New England were in that conversation. I thought Orlando could take the next step and be a supporter shield contender they finished second in the supporter shield standings yeah. last year they had an incredible year last year and they pretty much brought everybody back they had the duncan mcguire drama but then it ends up he's he's back um they've been a little perplexing some injuries um but they you know they i think they've got to figure it i think they will oscar Prey is a great coach and new england because that that new england team they they went through so much drama last year of course yeah. with, with bruce arena but before all that happened they were the team that looked like most likely to challenge Cincinnati for the supporter shield. They still have the talent. They still have Carlos heel, um, but they have, they have been struggling, right? I mean, the results haven't been there. Caleb Porter guaranteed a win and they got it. You know, it's kind of classic Caleb bravado, but they're dumped out of the CONCACAF champions cup in emphatic fashion by club America. I think the, you know, you kind of throw that away because of how the first leg went. Second leg doesn't even matter. The series was over. Um, but yeah, th those two in the East, no doubt, surprised me that that they've gone out, gone off to a slow start. And and Seattle, I mean, Seattle has been decimated with injuries to begin the season. They started the year without pretty much the entire spine available. Um, suffered some more as the year went on. Pedro de la Vega plays like a game or two, and then he's gone for for two months. Their big, you know, young offseason signing, they'll be fine. They've done this many times before. Yeah. They've started slow and they pull it together. And, and I think the summer will be big for them as well. You know, they've, they've done, they've done, they've done summer transfers better than any team in MLS. A lot of times big summer signings kind of don't hit till that first full year because it's a feeling out period and they only get a few games. But you look at Ladero, you look at Ladero, you look at Rui Diaz and how they've come in in, in summer and, and just hit the ground running. Uh, you know, I, I think we might see something similar from them this year. So not concerned about Seattle long-term, but certainly it's been a difficult start for them that I would not have expected. All right. Now, and the list for uh, outstanding players so far, uh, it was a little bit uh, difficult because, uh, I mean, Messi has to play a whole lot, but he has a great when he has played. Uh, so I took him off for now. Uh, but yeah. I put, I think that the ones that have caught my eye more is Luis Suarez, uh, Jovalic, and then I had like a tie between Buonga and Jaco Marquez as yeah. So I, for me, I would push back on Bawanga because I think he's been disappointing to begin this season. I think he would say the same. I mean, we saw him miss a wide open goal in El Trafico that was uncharacteristic, missed a wide open goal in the Nashville game a couple of weeks earlier. He had two goals in that game, but just before halftime, he put a ball off the crossbar that was a sitter, open goal inside the six or just at the six. Um, then he, in a much more difficult moment, like 30 seconds later, he hit the post. Um, he is vastly underperforming his expected goals. Usually he, he overperforms. I, I kind of, I have a love hate relationship with expected goals. I think yeah. it has to, expected goals have to be used as a, as a, a way to interpret a player's season, but, but with an, with add in the eye test, right? You, you can't just say he's unlucky or you can't just say he's getting lucky or you know, he's overperforming, so it's going to come down, or he's underperforming, so it's going to come up, because it could be luck. It could also be skill, right? Like yeah. Lionel Messi will always overperform his expected goals because expected goals is a baseline of kind of the average player, right? That's what yeah. it is. The mod, It's the model of from this moment in this spot, given the thousands and thousands of data points that we have in, in world soccer, world football, what's likely and how likely is this going to be a goal? So that's the average. Well, Messi should be, he's the greatest player of all time. He should vastly overperform expected goals. That doesn't mean he's lucky. It means he's great. I do think though for Bawanga underperforming to begin this season, he's unlucky, or at least it's it's just variation, right? He has been unlucky. He has not been his best. Um, and that doesn't mean he's not good. That doesn't mean he will continue to underperform. I do think he will. He will, uh, you know, meet the expected goals. I think by the end of the year, he'll overperform him because he's a great player, especially in this league. But he has three goals and two of them are penalties. 
Um, and so for me, you know, he's had a disappointing start to the season um, for LAFC and, and by his own uh, standards as well. Yako Makis, oh, what a player. I agree. He's got to stay healthy, though. I mean, he's now he's hurt again. He, he was hurt a little bit last year. So I think for Atlanta and for him, you like got to stay on the pitch. If he does, he's my pick for the golden boot. Um, if he does, Atlanta could win MLS Cup. If he doesn't, they, they might be more yeah. difficult for them. Now, to win MLS Cup, they probably need Tiago Almada to stay, which I don't know that he will through the summer, or at least to replace him with someone that hits right away. Um, yeah, with Jovalich, I mentioned him before, and and Suarez. I, man, I'm su as surprised as anybody. I mean, we did several of their preseason games, Miami, and he looked... Uh, he looked like he was in pain. He looked like, right. Like he was kind of struggling to get around and, uh, you know, he has proven all of us that, that doubted in that sense, that wondered is a better word, proved us all wrong. He's a gamer and he's been at many times the Luis Suarez, uh, that we of old and the Luis Suarez that, that we've always, uh, always seen. So yeah, man, I know, you know, no, um, if, if, if he continues, if he can make it through the whole season. Man, no, no doubt that that he'll keep doing it, and and what a benefit that'll be to Miami. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that was one of the big uh, questions uh, in the offseason is like, what version of Luis Suarez are we gonna get? Are we still gonna get yeah. the Luis Suarez of that play great for Gremio, or are we gonna still see like a a, a player that's slowly down, going downhill? Uh, but also, far he's been great for for Miami. Is yeah, and he's a, all right. Uh, so I have, I have trouble finding players that. For me, have under delivered. I think the players won because of the Orlando situation. Uh, Luis Muriel hasn't played great so far, but after that, it's been difficult. Uh, so I put NYCFC collectively because they were very young this offseason and, and they still have a struggle to find their, their, their group. Yeah, man, I, I'm with you. You know, I think I brought, brought this up with the Red Bulls. So we did the New York City FC New York Red Bulls game last May, and I'm pretty sure. Uh, at the time, it was the two youngest teams in MLS. I, I had that in my notes. It wasn't a good game. It wasn't entertaining. The, the teams weren't great. Um, and I think the Red Bull, I, and I saw a similar problem, I thought, with both, which is that they just went, they both just went too young. And in this league, you've got to have balance. Yes, you can sign all these young, expensive players and you can flip them for, for big transfer fees, and that's great. But to succeed in the league, you have got to balance that out with veterans. You've got to balance out with veterans of the league, maybe of international football, both. Um, and neither of those teams did it. And, and it showed New York city didn't make the playoffs last year. The rebels barely did that. They, they made the play in game. Uh, I think that New York city's roster was not complete last year. And, and it wasn't really fair to Nick Cushing, their manager because of that. They corrected it a little bit in the off season, but I'm with you. I don't think enough. It's still just, you look at them and they're young and they're these young players and you watch them play. And who is that leader? Who's going to take the game in control and who's going to kind of rally everybody and, and make sure everybody, you know, kind of takes control of the game and is sharp. Look at the team that won in 2021. They had that balance. They had the young players that were exciting. And then look at a Tati Katsianos who was young, but who was it was incredible at the, at that at that age still in that stage of his career. But along with Tati, they had Maxi Morales, they had Alfredo Morales, they had Chano on the back line, they had Sean Johnson in goal, they had these leaders, Tinnerholm you know, was on that roster. They had these veterans and these leaders mixed with the young talent and it, and it worked great. Right. And they, and they won, they were deserved winners of MLS cup. And then I think over the year that, that kind of slowly dismantled in the years after that. And now they're trying to figure that out again. So yeah, fair, fair to call them. I think, you know, that, that disappointment. And, and I wonder what kind of city football group is thinking and what, what NYCFC is thinking about, philosophically building the roster and for New York city FC and what they want New York city to be New York city FC to be there. It's going to be their years away still, but they're moving into a stadium in the Bronx, right. Uh, or in Queens next to city field. And that's huge. That is huge for this league. That is huge for American soccer to have a soccer specific stadium in New York city, in the five boroughs on the, on the subway line next to city field. People are used that cannot be overstated. From a from one from a MLS standpoint in the biggest market in in the United States and in one of the most influential, if not the most influential market in the world, uh, and from a national team perspective, to be able to host games in New York City if you want, we'll see competitive games 
you know, as we know, right, could could be interesting there. They've got to be, I think, when they move into that stadium, they've got to have it figured out and they've got to contend because in a city like New York, you've got to win. And it's a huge, huge opportunity for them to have their own building in New York City. But they've got to be good when they move into that building. And so how they get there, again, we're years away, but how they get there and how they build the roster to that point is going to be really interesting. For sure. Uh, now to a little bit of underrated signings. Uh, I, I came up with two. Uh, I think Joseph Pencil in the sense that uh, Gabriel Peck was the one that got the spotlight yeah. for for, for Ibagasi, and he's been incredible so far. And the other one, even though he got uh, a little bit of headlines, I think he has started very well for this team. And I have Jordan Mihailovic for Florida Rapids uh, as the two underrated signings that probably not be enough about. Yeah, I think, look, the Rapids have, have got to be um... – you got to be pleased with how they started. It, the season opener was brutal in in Portland, and I think a little unfair. I mean, it was four nil at halftime, but the Timbers took like their first four chances of the game, and I think as we've seen, that was a little unsustainable. Portland's had an up and down beginning of the season since then, um, and they've the Ra- the Rapids have done well, I think, to kind of bounce back from that. Re- not you know going to, into too big of a funk because of that. They came back for the draw against Miami with Messi on the pitch last weekend. We talked about them coming back to beat LAFC. That's two, that's two big, big, big clubs in a row where you're down late and you come back to either win against LAFC or draw and steal a point in Miami with Messi returning to the pitch and scoring a goal right after coming on, right, in his return. That to me says a lot about the team. That's something that if I'm Chris Armis, I'm I'm really pleased with. And Georgi Mihaljevic has been a huge part of that. I'm with you on Joseph Paintsel. I mean, right. I mean, he was like a $9 million player and Peck was like a $10 million player. So they yeah. spent a lot of money on both of them. But you're right. I mean, Peck was the one who, he's the biggest tra- he's the biggest transfer fee in club history. And that made the headlines. Paintsel has been the more productive of the two. They're... They have similar qualities. Uh, we've talked to Greg Vanny about him before this El Trafico, and he, he kind of pointed out Paint Soul's ability to combine is better. A little, you know, he, he wants Peck to get there. Paint Soul's a more experienced player than Peck is, whereas Peck is so good one v one and so good behind. Paint Soul also has that, but he can he can combine in possession moments as well. But those two guys, to me, I think are, are the signings of the off season so far. You know. That end up might be might end up being Luis Suarez uh, by himself, but I just think what they have done, what they've added to the galaxy and 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 changed the way that team looks going forward and the threats that they have going forward uh, has been immense. So yeah, all in on Joseph Paintsel and the impact he's had on the galaxy and the season he's going to continue to have. All right, the last category I I, I wrote down was teams that are still having a hard time to, to figure out. And in the list have Toronto FC, Portland Timbers, and Sporting KC. I guess uh, Portland has been great at Fair. home, but there's a couple of, of, of games that they haven't been as great. Sporting KC had a couple of big leads that they squandered, and then Toronto FC started well, and then the last two games have been really, really hard. Agreed, right? <laughs> like I know Portland so well, right? So I, I can start there. Yeah, they've they've had a trend lately of of starting out really poorly in games and conceding first and sometimes second and last week and third, but then kind of getting back into it and, and coming back. And I think there's two ways to look at it. Like if you're, if you're a coach, if you're a manager, you're going to be thrilled that they don't give up. You're going to be thrilled that there's a reaction. Uh, the Timbers on the Timbers website and their social media platforms, there's a kind of behind the scenes video of the game against Kansas city. They were down three, nothing at halftime. They came back for a three, three draw and you're in the locker room with Phil Neville you you hear his speech or you hear about half his speech because the other half of it is bleeped out. Uh, you know, you at the end of the game, same thing. And and it's a fun, a fascinating look to Phil and 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 what that locker room was like. But if you are Phil, you're happy that that produced a reaction and that the guys showed fight and pride in the result. Um, on the other hand, yeah, you're concerned at the slow starts, right? And so as a coaching staff, that's what you're focused on. You're focused on figuring out the slow starts and making sure that, that doesn't happen again, while also being pleased that you know the guys will fight and that they're together and that they'll have pride. Um, they are difficult to figure out in, in that regard, I think, right? Um, I, they've got a lot of talented pieces. Evander, went, like he can take over games and he has a few times. He's kind of pulled them along. Jonathan Rodriguez has been, it was a big signing and it's interesting. I 
I wonder where his best position is because he played on the wing, right? It, for league on the left wing was kind of where we're used to seeing him playing in Liga MX and and to such success. But the Timbers signed him pretty explicitly to be a number nine to fill that missing spot. Well, when Felipe Mora came out at halftime and played the nine, and and Rodriguez moved to the left wing against Kansas City, they they looked more dangerous, I think, and maybe that just coincided with again a halftime wake up down three nil. But there also might be something to that. So how the Timbers deal with that, I think, going forward is, is going to be really interesting. Um, Kansas City, yeah. I mean, it's they're the opposite, right? They've started out great. I think the number is before the before 63-30 on the clock, they're outscoring teams 11-1. to 1. After 63-30 on the clock, they're being outscored 9-1. to 1. I can't just say the 64th minute because they have conceded. They've scored a goal in the 64th minute, and they've conceded a goal in the 64th minute. But one was before 63-30. One was after it. So... That's a problem if you're Peter yeah. Vermees, right? I mean, they they dropped three points to the Galaxy. They were up 2-0 at home after the 70th minute. Galaxy's storm back, scored three. Boom, they lose. Last weekend, up 3-0 at halftime. Have a penalty to go up 4-0. Bad miss by Willie Agata. Can see the penalty a couple minutes later. Can see the second and then a third. And it what should have been a blowout at home. Ends 3-3 and the points are split. Great comeback by the Timbers. More points dropped by Kansas City. I think it's nine points dropped from leading positions this year. So th- th- those are concerning things if you're Peter Vermees, no doubt about it. But he'll figure it out. He figured it out last year where they had such a terrible start to the season and then were the best team in the league from May on, defeated their rivals in the playoffs, an 8-1 upset. Um, they'll, they'll figure it out. And look, Alan Polito has been injured the past couple of games. Johnny Russell's been injured. I think Kansas City will be okay. Toronto is interesting because they began the season with Insigne bought in, Bernadeschi bought in, to John Herdman and John Herdman, he, he was on my broadcast partner, Taylor Twelman's podcast offside with Taylor Twelman on Apple podcasts. And if you haven't listened to it, if you're interested in him and you're interested in Toronto, it is this wonderful, uh, open and frank and honest conversation, uh, where he speaks about the loss of his sister and his own mental health. And, um, it, it just is, is a moving conversation. And he talks about his philosophy and he talks about, you know, what he wants and how he's going to lead Toronto. And, and he got the best out of Insigne and Bernadeschi to start the season. Insigne is now hurt. They've got to deal with that. Look, that you lose a guy like that, uh, any team in the league, if he's not, first of all, you lose a bought in Lorenzo Insigne, which is what they had to begin this season. It's going to bring your team down a little bit. Um, but yeah, that, that they're going to be interesting. I think, because I think Kansas city will be okay. I think the Timbers will level out and they'll, they'll be okay. Toronto, they're young. They've got these stars. If Insigne can come back and be 100%, I think he could carry them really high with, with Bernadeschi as well. Then maybe they make some signings. If he has injury problems throughout the year and you've got a lot of young guys in these big roles, they they might go the other way. For me, I, I think they're the more unsure of the three, and I'm really curious to see how the rest of the season goes for Toronto. I want to uh, ask you about uh, uh, a little bit about how you went to in your transition because you work the the play by play for the the Portland Timbers. I guess to tell uh, the audience to how the the opportunity for the Apple TV came about. Yeah, man. So I was the you know the Portland Timbers television voice uh, from the end of 2015 until 2022 until uh, the local media uh, landscape, local broadcast landscape in, in MLS. Um, you know, went away and, and it changed and, and it went to Apple TV, the entire league uh, MLS season pass on Apple TV, a, a groundbreaking deal and partnership league wide. And I think all of us uh, that were in my, my position of being, you know, the local play-by-play broadcaster for a team in, in late 2022, when the Apple deal was announced, we were all in the same boat of, um, you know, not, not knowing what the future held and knowing that, of course, there'd be these positions with MLS season pass and, and with Apple TV and, you know, um, hoping to, to be part of it. I shouldn't say we all were. I certainly was. This is this is what I love. I love um, soccer. I love major league soccer. I love, uh, you know, and always have. I grew up in Chicago, a diehard Chicago Fire fan. And for me, it's always been MLS over over European leagues, which I watch and enjoy and appreciate. But my heart has always been with MLS. So for me, it was... Yeah, of course, you know, wanting to be involved and hoping I could be involved. And we all went through, you know, uh, I think a, a hiring process that was that was what you would expect for for a project that starts, right? Like anybody in any industry and business would would understand and relate to. 
And, uh, you know, man, I, I, uh, one feel felt so honored and, and happy personally to, to be part of the group at all. Um, and to be in the the position that, that I have been, you know, partnered with Taylor Twelman is, you know, go, go the lead broadcast team, which is, which is what we are on MLS season pass and calling the all-star game and calling MLS cup and calling all traffic on July 4th in front of 80,000 people at the Rose bowl, LA, LAFC, which was remarkable. And, and calling Lionel Messi and Inter Miami's uh, run in League's Cup and a lot of their games as, as the season went on um, has been a dream for me. It is you know, literally my, if, if I could have, when I was 18, 19, 20, described to you my dream job in this business that I knew I wanted to go into, it would be this. It would be the lead play-by-play -play broadcaster for MLS on the biggest MLS games every week. Uh, and I just uh, I feel, felt you know so fortunate to have been able to do it now for a year and a half and hopefully continue to do it for, for as long as possible. And um, an, an honor as well and, and a pressure and a privilege. You know, I, I something I take really seriously, right? Like that this, um, you know, documenting this league that, that I, I love so much and that I feel so strongly about um, to be the kind of primary documentarian of that from a, from a play-by-play -play standpoint means a lot to me. And um, yeah, it's just, it's been a thrill. It's been quite a ride and uh, can't wait to, you know, for more thrilling moments throughout this season and, and into the future. All right. And uh, how has been that uh, relationship with Tula Kovana, who has been covering the MLS for, for, for years now? It's great, man. It's great. Taylor's great. Taylor's my guy. Um, you know, we, we knew each other before we started working together, but just a little bit. Taylor would obviously come to Portland all the time with ESPN. Um, they stole a lot of our games. They stole a lot of our big games, right? Uh, you know, whether it be him and Adrian Healy or then him and John Champion. And so they'd come out and and they'd come to training and, you know, we'd all be together on on the side of the pitch at, at training because I'd be calling those games on the radio the next day if they were doing them for ESPN. Um, you know, I was fortunate to, to call several games for ESPN over the – the kind of the five years prior to, to this Apple deal as well. When say Taylor and John were doing, you know, say there's a double header, Taylor and John were in LA and there'd be a game in DC uh, or a game in Portland and, and ESPN would, would call me up and um, I would call it with a Danny Higginbotham or a Brian Dunseth. Um, you know, fortunate to get a handful of those. And so kind of through that, I, I knew Taylor a little bit as well, um, but certainly not, not great. Right. You know, uh, and it was awesome, man. He's, he was you know, from the get go. He, he's been wonderful to me. Um, and I think our, our chemistry, you know, was, was pretty natural and pretty immediate. We, we both love this game and we both love MLS and we both believe so strongly in this product. And I think we both want it to be as good as it can be. Right. And, and, and you know, we know the impact it can have 107 countries on, on Apple TV through MLS season pass. And I think we both so badly just want it to be as good as it can be, not just our broadcast. Obviously that's our primary focus, but everything. And so our conversations are a lot about that and the things that he pushes for. And he's an influential voice, right. Are about the good of the, the, the whole project. And I so appreciate that from him. We have fun together on the road. You know, he's uh Taylor off screen is Taylor on screen, right? That's not the case from everybody. Some people are very different off camera than on camera. Uh, not Taylor, man. The Taylor you get on, on TV is the Taylor we get at dinner is the Taylor we got having a beer after a game. Um, so it's been great. I, I feel really fortunate to, uh, have been paired with him and, and, you know, how he accepted me as, as somebody like, I say that I say it going that way, because to your point, he was the lead voice of ESPN for a decade. Right. And so I'm newer to that national space, so to speak. Um, and he's been great from day one and now, now we're good friends and, uh, yeah, it feels natural now. So it's, uh, it's been awesome. Are you, what, what game are you, are you going this week? This week, we've got a big one. Uh, it's sporting Kansas city hosting inter Miami. And it's at Arrowhead Stadium, so where the Kansas City Chiefs play. Big crowd expected. It'd be interesting what Miami looks like coming in off of the CONCACAF Champions Cup against Monterey. We're recording this on Wednesday afternoon before that game, before the second leg, full transparency. Uh, but should be should be an awesome crowd and, and a great atmosphere for, for Messi and Miami coming to Kansas City. Yeah, that's going to be a, a big one. And also, I want to ask you a little bit of... Uh, so, obviously, when you're... It's different when you're covering one team like Portland and you know the team and you, and you yeah. get to talk to coaches. Uh, just talk to how different is the preparation throughout the week for each game because uh, it's you just see a traffic now you're doing, uh, as you mentioned, Sport KC and Inter Miami. Um, how much time do you need to prepare for uh, or how much games uh, do you watch, replace? 
Yeah, well, a lot of people in in my Twitter mentions would say that nothing's changed. We're just doing it with Miami instead of Portland, uh, which, which is not true. <laughs> um, you know, we yes, we've done a lot of Miami games, but but uh, we do other games as well, which we quite enjoy, to be honest. Um, yeah, it, it's different, but look, I've I've always been somebody. I said this earlier. I, I love the whole league, and I've always focused on the whole league. So for me, I've always felt relatively knowledgeable about every team in major league soccer. Now, of course I've called for, you know, an eight year uh, stretch, literally every Portland Timbers game. So every moment, you know, is seared in my brain and it's impossible to watch every game in full 90 minutes. Now there's 14 games a week, right? Just, it's just not possible. And then prep for your game and do everything else you have to do. Um, so is there a slight, less level of expertise. Yeah. Right. But on the other hand, um, you know, when, when prepping for like when I was doing the Timbers games, like the prep was, was always more about the opponent because I didn't need to prep for the, for the Timbers. So the prep is similar in the sense. It's just kind of sometimes two teams, right. Rather than, than one. Now, if you've done, a, you know, if we do a couple of LFC games in a row or Miami games or whatever, then, then that's easier. But I always try to watch, you know, fully a full games ahead, right? We know our schedule about two months at a time. So try to watch, you know, plan out, making sure I'm watching the full games of, of several games ahead of the teams I've got to do. Um, and, you know, obviously otherwise you watch at, at the very least, you know, the highlight package of every game around the league. Um, you know, the games that even if teams that I'm not going to don't have on my schedule. Um, so yeah, different, but I love it. I, you know, again, I, I, um, when I was calling Timbers games and before I was calling Timbers games, it wasn't like I just only watched Timbers games and didn't pay attention to the rest of the league. I mean, I was glued to my television uh, Saturday morning when I woke up, if there were games on MLS live or ESPN plus or whatever it was through the Timber no, start, then East coast games would start and probably would watch the first half before I'd have to go to Providence park. If it was a home game. Then the standalone Sunday games when there was Viernes de football, you know, on the Friday night games on uh, Lunavision, uh, you know, family of channels, watch those. So yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's always been the entire league. Um, so I, I yeah, n not a huge difference in how I consume it. Um, obviously, yes, the individual kind of mechanisms of prep are slightly different because it's at times just two different teams that, you've got to dig a little deeper into to get all of the, the nuance and all of the fine details correct. Cause it has to be, um, but yeah, I love it. I mean, I've always loved it. Like I said earlier, it's just, you know, how I've always kind of wanted it to be. And um, yeah, I loved, I shouldn't say, I don't mean to disparage or put down the, uh, my role with the Timbers. Cause that was a dream job of mine. And uh, I loved that every second of it. Um, and I also love this, just they're a little different. Yeah, for sure. So, um, now talking about the game that you had this weekend, I mean, what were some of the, the things that you were hoping to see uh, or the questions that you want to answer in that game between Sport KC and Inter Miami? Yeah, look, I mean, when, every time it's Inter Miami, let's you know, start with with Messi and them and I hope he plays. Um, of course, you know, I like I think everybody does. It's going to be a big crowd and they're going to be there. Um, a lot of them are going to be there to see him, right? And I think it's okay to say that. We've called a lot of Messi games and a lot of Miami games. And you know, there's going to be a lot of, pink number 10 jerseys and a lot of number 10 Barcelona jerseys and a lot of number 10 Argentina jerseys. And, and that's okay. And, and it's awesome. Um, a lot of times they're cheering for Messi, you know, and if he starts on the bench, the, the chants begin when he gets to warm, when he starts to warm up, it's like a throw in and everybody's going nuts and you're like, what's happening. Oh, Messi stood up. Um, and that's okay. He's, he's the biggest star in the world. Uh, I won. I hope that the Kansas City crowd, the people that are there for Kansas City, show up and are loud for Kansas City. And we've seen that. I mean, some of these games have been so fun to call because it's both ways. Like, you think about it. If if we're calling El Trafico last weekend, BMO Stadium, there's a pocket of LA Galaxy fans. And that's this isn't the best example because there's going to be more away fans at that game than others. But for the most part, it's a it's one way traffic. If LAFC is doing something great, the crowd's going nuts. If the Galaxy are doing something great, they're hushed or they're booing. Um, it's rare that you get a game where it's 
the crowd is mixed. So you get cheering either way. And that creates this kind of crescendo of an atmosphere. We had it at the Rose Bowl last year, which was split 40,000, 40,000 LAFC, LA Galaxy. Uh, we've gotten it for some Miami games on the road because they'll show up to, you know, to cheer on their home team and they'll show up to cheer on Messi. And so it's this both ways, which makes it really fun to call. I hope Kansas City, the, their supporters show up to, again, to give it to Miami, give it to Messi and and give it for Sporting Kansas City. Now, uh, on the pitch, yeah, if Messi can play, right, can he keep it going? Because they're such a different team with and without Messi. The numbers are staggering. Goals scored, goals against, record. Um, I don't expect that to change if he's playing. For Kansas City, what we talked about, a little bit ago when we were mentioning their kind of how do you figure them out in, in that category of team? Can they start strong and finish strong, which they haven't really been able to do this year? Emphasis on the finish strong because they've started strong and they haven't finished strong. Um, and can they do that against a team that at times has felt inevitable in Inter-Miami, even if they're down 1-0, 2-1 in the 90th minute, almost inevitable that there's going to be a moment for them. Kansas City has been the team this year where it's been inevitable the other way. They've been up and it's been almost inevitable that they'll concede. So how, if they have a lead late, can they hold on um, and and kind of buck their trend and do it against the team that might be the most difficult to hold off in those moments in the league in Miami? That That's what I'll be looking at. Already. And just uh, looking a little uh, further ahead, I want to talk briefly about Leagues Cup. Uh, I mean, last year was... I was excited about it, but I didn't know what to expect in a way. Yeah. It was such a great tournament. Uh, yeah. But now I'm worried that we may not reach that <laughs> level again. They might not be as interesting. But uh, what are your expectations and, and how? I know you had a couple of great games that you called, uh, but uh, what do you expect for, for, for 2024 and what are you excited to see? I agree with you completely. I didn't know what to expect about League's Cup. Now, when it was announced, I, I thought it was a great idea. And I think you can probably go back. I mean, it was announced a couple of years ago. And I think you can even go back on like a Talk Timbers, which is you know, a podcast that for the Timbers that I had co-hosted for years. And when it probably the week it broke and we talked about it. And I think I, I said, this is awesome. And I believe that. Like I, I thought the concept's wonderful. Uh, it's compelling. It's intriguing. And as long as all of the teams bring it and don't treat it as, you know, friendlies, I thought it'd be a, an amazing competition. Um, I didn't think it, but you didn't know, you didn't know, right. You didn't know how teams were treated and you didn't know how, what support would be like. And you didn't know if the stadiums would fill up. Um, and it was the best case scenario in every way. It exceeded my expectations and it's not just messy. Now look, Messi added to it and he, it was as though somebody wrote the script, the way he debuted and scored the, the goal, the free kick at the death against Cruz Azul. I mean, there's no better way to do it. And then they, they won the whole thing. Uh, incredible. But it wasn't just that. I mean, there were so many other thrilling, fantastic games that didn't involve Miami, that had great crowds. We did a wild Nashville Club America game that like we thought had ended and everybody thought had ended and there's fans like invading the pitch. The invading might be the wrong word. Coming on the pitch to celebrate, try to celebrate with Club America and nobody knows that this penalty is in review because the keeper was off the line and then 10 minutes later they've got to start it again. Just And the regulation of that game was crazy too because I believe Sam Surridge scored at the very end to even send it to penalties. I mean, it was that was awesome. Um, there were there were many other games, Monterey's comeback against LAFC that were that were thrilling. Um, so will it top that? Man, it's gonna be hard to your point, right? And I guess that is the problem with starting with such great heights is that it's hard to follow up, right? If you're if you're if the original is perfect, how do you improve on that on the sequel? But I do think because of how it went last year, I think this this edition will be uh, will be great. It will be compelling. I think there's going to be heavy motivation from uh, the Liga MX specifically the Giants, to have a better showing. You know, the three CONCACAF Champions Cup spots all went to MLS teams last year, two MLS teams in the final. Um, the format helped MLS, no doubt about it. I like what they're doing this year with giving um, – some leeway to hosting for the best league MX teams, right? So you're going to have Club America and and Chivas and Tigres and Monterey being able to have bases 
um, at, for various amount of times. And, you know, instead of Tigres, they're in a group with Miami. And instead of them having to go to Miami, they're going to host Miami at Energy Stadium in Houston, Texas, in front of 75,000 people or whatever it'll be, which is going to be incredible. And they can host games in Houston as well, you know, into, into the knockout round. Cuba America would host until the final um, which is great in, you know, host right in their base. So they don't have to travel yeah. and they choose Southern California where they know they'll have incredible support and it will be a very pro, it will be a home crowd. And honestly, we did a lot. We did multiple of their games last year. It was a home crowd where no matter where they go in the United States, in North America, Mexico, yeah. United States, it's a home game for club America. Um, and it'll be even more so given that they have total control of, of where it's going to be and, and all that. So I like that. I like that change to the format and uh, I'm, I'm intrigued to see kind of what, you know, the revenge of Liga MX is, so to speak in the second edition of leagues cup. Yeah. And that, that's, I think that the big, the big uh, storyline uh, is uh, how the MX tries to make a better impression. I think they sort of started that with this year's Champions Cup. Uh, they yes. come, come back with a vengeance uh, of winning 10th. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, because it's obviously uh, they're gonna be two or three games into the season, or maybe even preseason, depending on, on their schedule. But it's gonna be uh, interesting to see how they try to improve from last year. Totally. Uh, and if that look, that narrative tonight could change. If Miami comes back and beats Monterey yeah. in Monterey, all of a sudden the narrative a week ago, two days ago, that. There's going to be four Liga Emekis teams in the semifinals. You know, League's Cup was an aberration because the games were all played in the United States. That flips completely if Miami yeah, can get this done tonight because now you have Miami and Columbus both going into Monterey and taking out Tigres and Monterey at home in the second leg. Now it, the, the narrative goes back to where it was, right? So yeah. it's a big game tonight in that regard. Yeah, and if that happens, uh, you have a guaranteed Liga MX MLS final. Yes, uh, exactly. The, the, yeah. Yeah, Which would be awesome. Yeah. And I yeah, think, yeah. look, I think, I think, look, we're neutral. I'm neutral, but that's what you want for League's Cup as well. You know, yeah. like that, that's kind of the yeah. right. I mean, that's the point. It's, it's all, it's both leagues coming together for this big tournament. And that makes it, I think, the most interesting. You want a, a Mexican giant against an MLS giant in the League's Cup final. And that's the most compelling it can be. Already. And just to wrap this up here, uh, just before we came uh, on, uh, MLS announced that they're going to relax about the roster rules, uh, which is something that fans have been like, really pushing for, uh, and some other teams. Uh, so, um, without going necessarily to the specifics of it, uh, what are your, how do you hope that this helps MLS uh, roster build not only to compete in Champions Cup and, and at least Cup, but potentially next year we have the, the Club World Cup. Seattle's going to be there. At least one MLS, more MLS team is going to be there. Um, so what do you hope that this does to help things? Uh, yeah, yeah, to, right. So look, as we're talking now, it's not official yet. It, it's reported, right, that Board of Governors meeting um, was this week. And and that's, you know, like I, I have no reason to doubt the reporting from from great journalists uh, at The Athletic who, who are who have detailed potential changes. Um, if if these changes are enacted, if it's what happens. Yeah, I think it's. Look, MLS is evolving, right? And it's something that Taylor Taylor Twelman, my broadcast partner, talks a lot about on, on his podcast and even on a broadcast if it comes up, that, that spending is going to open up. This is a league that's always done it intelligently and for good reason, right? And I know everybody wants it to just open wide up, but go, like we in America still have – you know, the memory of the NASL and that league failed. It was at huge heights – and it ultimately failed. And now I don't think MLS is in danger of that. It's in a very different spot. We're going to be in our third, MLS is going to be in its 30th season next year, which is remarkable. Um, but it has gotten to 30 seasons by being smart, by being intelligent, and maybe by opening up the salary cap slower than some people would want. But it's here and it's there and it's thriving and it's the healthiest an American soccer league has ever been. And that's a good thing. Um, I do think to your point, like, yeah, it, it, it's got to happen. Um, I think that Miami is pushing things and that's good, right? The galaxy pushed things in 2007. They said, we can't, we can do it. We can bring David Beckham here. That will change the league. They got it done. They added the, what at the time was colloquially known as the Beckham rule. Now we all know it was a designated player rule. 
And that was driven by that move. And it undoubtedly was, was great for this league. And now we, every team's got three um, Miami wants to, and can push this, right? They, uh, people want to play with Messi and Sergio and Jordy and Luis and Miami. And they, you know, say, Hey, we can sign these players, you know, they're going to push for it. And that helps because it brings the whole league forward. I, I think, um, again, as long as the league does it intelligently, which I have no doubt they will, cause they always have, I think it's great. Um, the league, you know, to, to, to continue to grow. Yeah. You've got to spend more. Like it's, it is, a, that's just the reality of it. It's, it's, it's a business players. The best players will more often than not take the better salary. That's human beings. It's not just soccer. It's life, right? Yeah. When it comes to jobs. And so anybody can relate to that. So to get better players, you have to spend more money. I do think of depth of rosters is something, right? And that, that's what seems to be, you know, being addressed, at least an option of being addressed. If, if you, you know, if the reporting ends up being, being true, it'll allow teams to build rosters in different ways. Some teams can choose to, you know, add more kind of top heavy, so to speak, add another huge star. Some can choose to spread some of that money out in the depth of the roster. That's a good thing. I think it's a good thing to have diversity of roster builds. I think at times in the history of MLS, you've had teams that, that teams are kind of forced to build rosters the same way, which it's kind of, everything's too similar. And yeah, still obviously some teams did it better than others. And that's why teams won. But I think it's okay. If we say, okay, you can build it this way. You can build it that way. That's fine. Um, so yeah, I, I think it'd be positive. I think it's inevitable. Um, and I think it's the right time and, and, you know, we'll be done in the right way uh, for MLS to continue to grow and continue to thrive. And as you mentioned, big, big few years for soccer in in the United States, you know, I, I've always been one, I could be wrong, man. I'm not, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just a commentator, but I've always been one that's thought, yes, I'm at world cup in 2026 is huge for, for soccer in this country, but like, just like the NASL did, like you can't, you've got to look long-term and not short-term and MLS needs to be positioned to take advantage of that as well as they can, but they also need to be positioned to survive for the long-term because there's going to be a world cup in 2030 and 30, right? Like we're going to pretty soon, we're going to be 10 years removed from the American world cup. Um, and in 2004, right? Like we were 10 years removed from the 94, where was MLS then a different spot than it was now. But anyway, so I just think, yeah, um, doing it, the right way, the smart way, carefully is the way to go. I think the league is doing that. And I look forward to seeing what happens with this and, and how different teams, if indeed uh, there become kind of options and how to build a roster at the top, um, how different teams approach that and, and what it looks like. All righty. Uh, that's uh, Jason here on the Local Podcast. Thank you so much. I appreciate taking the time. I appreciate uh, you coming on the podcast. Hopefully we'll, we'll see you sometime in the year. Amen. Great to chat with you, Edwin.